So everyone, uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and get started, and I, I want to welcome everyone to uh, the afternoon session where we're continuing uh, the, uh, the, the deep reflection on, on the tremendous career uh, of Franklin, Franklin Knight. Uh, this time, we're taking an even deeper look uh, into uh, his work in the Caribbean, his impact on Atlantic studies. And we have an, another all-star lineup uh, for you. Uh, Sherwin Bryant, who is, who is here at present toward the end, is associate professor at Northwestern University. Uh, he's a historian of colonial Afro-Latin America and the uh, Atlantic Pacific worlds. Uh, he has worked at the intersections of cultural, legal, social history, uh, and political economy with an emphasis on black life in the kingdoms of New Granada and Quito, uh, which is mo now modern-day Colombia uh, and Ecuador. Uh, we also have with us uh, Marina uh, Goldman, uh, who's an assistant professor at uh, Princeton University, uh, who specializes in the history of Latin America and Caribbean, and her research and teaching focus on social movements, uh, political theory, labor and migration, and Caribbean feminisms uh, is, is really tearing up the charts at that moment. And her current project examines how World War I transformed African uh, Afro-Caribbean's understanding of and engagements with uh, the British Empire. Guadalupe Garcia uh, is an associate professor at Tulane, uh, who specializes in the histories of cities and colonialism in Latin America and the Caribbean, and her research examines the intersections of colonialism, empire, and urban space, and focuses on free black uh, and enslaved peoples in Havana. And finally, uh, uh, Harvey Neptune, uh, an associate professor at Temple University, whose research focuses on the Caribbean, uh, Latin America, the African diaspora, imperialism, transnationalism, nation-making, popular culture, post-colonialism, uh, the history of petroleum in the Soviet Union. I don't know what you're right. You have about 15 things there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, without further ado, we have a tremendously uh, expert panel uh, to, to comment. Uh, we're going to hear from each of them and then engage in discussion and open it up for conversation. Uh, sure. I would like to begin my remarks by thanking Mika Makalani and the Center for Africana Studies here at the Johns Hopkins University for the invitation to participate in this event. It is truly an honor to be here and to offer a few remarks about Professor Franklin Knight, a giant in a range of overlapping areas and subfields whose work and exemplar has and continues to inspire generations of scholars, including myself. I'd also like to give a very special thanks to Kanita Tavares for her hard work in organizing my travel and stay here. The opportunity to, to participate in this historic and august occasion provided me with a mandate to think with the work of Professor Knight, whose work <coughs> really has in influenced the historical inquiry in a, in a series of fields, Caribbean history, Latin American history, Atlantic history, comparative slavery, sugar, commodities and environment, and of course, Cuban history. I came to the work of Professor Knight by way of two of his contemporaries, Lolita Gutierrez Brockington, who was then my professor at North Carolina Central University when I was in undergraduate school, who introduced me to Latin American history and historiography, and also by way of the work of his colleague, the esteemed Colin Palmer. And who was at the time teaching at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Between Lolita's uh, teachings, her lectures, as well as her own work uh, on Latin America, as well as her engagements with Palmer and her insistence that we read uh, then out of print, Slaves of a White God, which had been published in 1976, I came to, to understand the importance and the reach of Professor Knight's work. It would be a while before I would actually read Knight's Slave Society in Cuba during the 19th century and come to learn that Palmer and Knight had in fact been graduate students at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Over the years, I was nurtured and mentored in much of the fashion that has been described by Professor Knight today, by Professor Brockington herself, uh, encouraging me to go on to graduate school. And coming out of the program that I came out of, 
I essentially thought that what we were trying to do was a version of black history and became interested in studying black America in particular. I wanted to then attend grad school and look at this particular variant or stem of black history, which then began to lead me into thinking about Latin American historiography. By then the field was constrained, I think, in many ways by questions of mestizaje, grounded in notions of a more benign form of slavery in Latin America, and other notions of Latin American racial exceptionalism. Africans and African descendants were, to quote Professor Knight, in a way, an act within a play, rather than the play itself, as has already been mentioned in terms of his adage about the Caribbean. And yet somewhere in the work of Professor Knight, I began to see some light, some ways of beginning to move beyond these particular frames within Latin American historiography, and to begin to think about the ways that Africans themselves shape the Caribbean and shape Latin America. Begin to think about the ways in which they themselves might in fact be the play itself. On to graduate school, and then I began to take candidacy exams and really began to get to know the field and the importance of Professor uh, Knight's work then and now. And although the field has now expanded to include what many have come to call Afro-Latin America, we can still use, I think, a deeper infusion of what I'm calling here Knight vision. <laughs> <laughs> and this is to say that Knight's treatment of the Caribbean and the past history really began for me to eschew the more northern focused emphasis of Atlantic history and began to situate the Caribbean not as a kind of flyover stop or as a space from which to understand precedence and then move on to the main story, but to think about the ways in which this kind of simultaneous moving back and forth uh, between areas within Latin America and the Caribbean. I think Professor Knight's work really began to set up the stage for me to think about the Caribbean as a space from which we might begin to theorize and conceptualize Latin American history and historiography. And this particular night vision is still very much needed today because there is still a way in which Caribbean studies remains in some ways sort of at the margins of what we see as proper Latin American history and historiography. Now for night, the Caribbean was that crucial procession of European activity in the New World, a kind of theater stage with deep rank stages that extended past the locus of the Caribbean itself to constitute a range of theaters, stages, and histories. Early modes of slavery and slave trading and sugar production, for him, formed the basis of capitalism. I might seem passe to say this, but there's a way in which our debates and narratives about the question of capitalism has gone back to sort of question things that I saw Professor Knight really sort of pushing past and, and, and really sort of establishing uh, in his work and in his dialogues with the work of somebody like Eric Williams. I saw in Professor Knight's work a kind of eschewing of the ameliorative approaches to slavery and racial rule that were, and in some ways, remain far too present within the assumptions of certain areas of Latin American historiography. His work, I think, emphasized the importance of understanding the realities of slave societies and the process and impact of their transformation into plantation societies as marking off the realities of slave life. And so in this sense, we can see where Professor Knight is really in some ways in 1970 in slave society in 19th century Cuba, really pushing ahead of his time to focus less on the institution of slavery and the mechanisms of production to understand the meanings of slavery and the ways that these changes in a slave society impinged upon the lives of the enslaved. For Knight, Cuba was always a slave society. Right? And so there we see a kind of definition of what a slave society is, and that is to say slavery as being fundamental to the shaping of that society, of its social order, of its economics, as well as of its laws versus a plantation society, which I see Professor Knight as having showcasing, showcased the ways that sugar provided a kind of new economic base 
and created what he called a very different society, carving out a more important political and economic position for Cuba in the history of modernity itself. Ultimately, I wrestled with Professor Knight's uh, engagement with slavery and the importance of the law in slave society in Cuba during the 19th century. Here, Professor Knight's work really, I think, went very far to showcase the ways that laws themselves only begin to suggest a very small part of how it is that we might begin to understand a given society. Um, at that time, Knight's work um, really challenged the, the Tannenbaum thesis and really began to sort of move into the question of comparative slavery, right? Not so much by taking up the comparative framing itself in a direct way, but really beginning to move further and show the embeddedness and the entanglements of Cuban slavery with the broader Caribbean society, with the Atlantic itself, with areas within the United States, as well as parts of Latin America. So this is to say that that sort of distinction between uh, Cuba, the Caribbean, and say the US, or the old frames of comparative slavery really did not hold up uh, in Professor Knight's analysis of slave society in Cuba, which is very interesting because there's a way in which the field sort of returns to that frame uh, in a way that I, that I think actually is showcased in Knight's work as being you know, really uh, so less productive in the way. Okay. And one crucial point that I would sort of like to uh, meditate on here is the ways in which uh, the particular thesis, the Tannenbaum thesis, seems to sort of reassert itself in a way. And, and this, for me, really reminds us why it is that we actually need this night vision. Right? And so the way that Professor Knight summed up the thesis was, he said the attitude towards manumission is the, cru is the crucial element in slavery. It implies the moral status of the slave and foreshadows his role in the case of freedom. In other words, as I would put it, or as it's being put now in the field in some ways, the law of freedom came to define blackness rather than the, the imposition of slavery. And I think this is where we actually need to return to an understanding of the ways that slavery both shapes society <coughs> and reshapes society over time. And Professor Nice talks about these various revolutions, including the sugar revolutions, that begin to change the impact and the role of slavery in a given society, ultimately suggesting to us the ways that black freedom is always and already entangled with black unfreedom. And so this is to suggest that we need to return to an understanding of, of these kinds of entanglements, that there's a way in which we cannot actually think through the question of black freedom or the possibilities of black freedom without understanding the impositions and the impact of slavery across a given society. <clears throat> Ultimately, I think that the field would do well to return to these kinds of approaches, began to uh, rethink the question of the of mestizaje. And this is finally one of the, the aspects of Professor Knight's work that really impacted me. There's a way in which, rather than taking up questions of mestizaje, rather than taking up questions of whiteness or white meaning, or really even the question of race explicitly, Professor Knight's work really goes beyond that and showcases the, the problematics of these kinds of assumptions. And yet there's a way in which the field sort of continued to turn in on itself. And this is how I want to return to the ways in which Knight and Palmer's work really sort of work hand in hand for me in some ways, in both setting forth models that center the lives of enslaved people in their own sort of making and in the creation of new worlds and realities for themselves. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm so used to being at places where people don't respond. <laughs> Gosh, it's a joy for so many reasons to be among this community, right? Uh, people who know that when someone says good afternoon, right? That's an invitation, right, in 
So thank you. Thank you for reminding me that there's still spaces like that. Uh, so I'd like to join the chorus thanking Mika uh, Makalani, Sasha Turner, and Kadita Tavares for uh, inviting me to participate in this celebration of Professor Franklin Knight and for all of the work that they've done, both uh, publicly and behind the scenes, to bring us all here together for this truly transformative uh, opportunity to think together. It is an incredible honor, and really in many ways in my career, a singular honor, to have the opportunity to engage with Professor Knight, whose work both as a historian and as a dedicated mentor has shaped my own professional praxis and aspirations. Professor Knight, like so many of the scholars in this room, played a foundational role in establishing Caribbean studies and Afro-Latin American studies as vibrant fields of inquiry in the US Academy. The work of building working groups, programs, centers, and departments from the ground up, often with scarce resources and tepid, if that, institutional support, was frequently done in addition to their efforts to publish groundbreaking scholarship, develop new curricula, and mentor generations of students who are hungry to learn about the world beyond the United States and Western Europe. The fact that today courses in Caribbean history, Caribbean political thought, and Caribbean revolution are now regularly offered at universities across the United States is directly their legacy. Right? Professor Knight and his generation of scholars many of whom it's really important to know were part of the Caribbean diaspora, right? Um, helped to insist in the US Academy that the Caribbean was at the very center of the making of the modern world and offered a really radical critique of what came to be. My talk this afternoon gives me a chance to revisit uh, the very first, my very first encounter with Professor Knight's scholarship. Uh, like so many of us, I encountered his work first in uh, graduate school as part of my preparations for qualifying examinations, at a moment when I was very much questioning what my professional future could be as someone who was interested in the field of Caribbean history, uh, but it was in particular kind of thinking across linguistic boundaries and interested also in bridging uh, what I saw as uh, two really distinct at that moment literatures. On the one hand, I was drawn to the field because of the rich scholarship on black social movements in the region, right? Uh, what now scholars often refer to as both the traditions of black religious redemptive thought, right, and black political nationalism, particularly Garveyism, uh, as well as what was then a very separate literature, right, on the kind of development of political institutions uh, in the Caribbean. And so what did that mean for someone who did not want to study right, the Haitian Revolution or the Cuban Revolution, right? Uh, where was my place going to be? So as a graduate student then, I encountered uh, Professor Knight's book, uh, The Caribbean, Genesis of a Fragmented Nationalism. And I'll just call it uh, Genesis of a Fragmented Nationalism for short today. Uh, in my talk, I want to revisit this trailblazing work on the origins and development of nationalism in the Caribbean. I'll engage with the arguments that Professor Knight outlined in his classic study uh, and think about the ways in which this study gives us an opportunity to kind of rethink Caribbean nationalism in the context of hemispheric change. First published in 1978, as Professor Knight uh, explained in Oxford University Press's Latin American History series, uh, Genesis of a Fragmented Nationalism chronicled the development of nationalism in the Caribbean over the long durée, tracing the struggles of Caribbean peoples for self-determination from the late 15th century. And it's important to know that the book opens in the pre-colonial Caribbean, right? So creating a very different kind of temporal scope, right, for understanding the struggle for self-determination. We don't begin with Columbus's arrival, right? Um, tracing the struggle of Caribbean peoples for self-determination from the late 15th century to the 20th century. Since its initial publication 44 years ago, the book has been republished in two subsequent editions, the second edition appearing in 1990, including nearly 100 new pages of text from the first edition, and then a third edition that appeared in 2011. Genesis of a Fragment Nationalism offered a new paradigm in the US Academy for studying the historical processes that fueled nationalism in nationalist movements in the Caribbean. 
And I want to highlight uh, the ways in which Professor Knight's framework uh, really set a kind of new model, and very much in uh, shaping the ways, the kinds of questions we ask, and the ways in which we explore them methodologically. First, uh, as has been mentioned, Professor Knight embraced a pan-Caribbean approach, urging us to think across the political and linguistic boundaries that so often fragment scholarship on the region. Professor Knight insisted that the fragmentation that existed in the academy did not reflect the lived reality of Caribbean peoples. Knight argued the sum of the common experiences and understandings of the Caribbean outweigh the territorial and insular differences or particularities. To speak, there, uh, to speak, therefore, of Haitian, Jamaican, Cuban, or Caribbean characteristics should not be to speak of them as mutually exclusive. The first are merely variations or components of the last. Second, Professor Knight insisted that the study of Caribbean nationalism should foreground the perspective of ordinary people. Uh, he wrote, quote, the heroes are what Cuban poet Nicolas Guillén would call Juan Nadies, or common folk too, mention, too numerous to mention. And of course, now we would also include some Maria Nadies, right? Um, kind of thinking right, beyond kind of veil-centered narrative of nationalism to include quite a few Maria Nadies también. Right? Uh, as a part of this commitment to understanding the ways in which nationalism was not simply an elite project, Right, or a project we, uh, of a few great men. Right? Uh, Professor Knight also uh, insists that we center the experiences of Caribbean people rather than what was much more common then, kind of taking an imperial uh, perspective. So he writes uh, in a famous passage that, uh, several has, that has been invoked several times already. This history traces the genesis of the Caribbean from a decidedly international Caribbean and New World perspective. Many other histories are written from the viewpoint of European and imperial affairs, rendering the transformation of the region as a co as coincidental byproduct of other presumably larger or more important events. Such histories do not deny that the Caribbean had its day in the sun, but to change the metaphor, the history of the Caribbean was written merely as an act within a play. Here the act, here the act is the play, the main event. Uh, Professor Knight then goes on to highlight the ways in which, right, what does this mean to look at Caribbean nationalism, as he says, from the inside out, rather than privileging the views that come from elsewhere. He writes, it is of course valid to view Caribbean history uh, from the political and economic perspective of Africa, Europe, or mainland America, especially, I love this line, for Africans, Europeans, or mainland Americans. Right? But the validity of that view cannot and should not invalidate the local perspective. This is the only conscious slant that this history provides, to look from the inside out. Uh, for someone on the inside is not only legitimate, it is the only view. Right? So here from in the 1978 version, right, Professor Knight insists that the study of Caribbean nationalism must foreground the perspectives analytical categories and priorities of Caribbean people. The fact that now, right, that is, I would say, hopefully, the accepted view, right, uh, should not help, should not cloud us, right, from how uh, this was certainly not the case then, okay. right? Uh, to highlight that fact, right, I want to point out uh, a review of the 1978, so the first version of Genesis of Fragmented Nationalism, that appeared in no less than the American Historical Review. Uh, Professor Bruce Solnit right, uh, begins his review by seemingly welcoming Professor Knight's uh, innovative perspective and vision, right? uh, calling attention to the fact uh, for a need of Caribbean nationalism uh, that uh, thinks about the region collectively. Yet ultimately, at the conclusion of his review, uh, he condemns the book, right, uh, lambasting it in this way. He writes in the second paragraph, this is Caribbean history from a Caribbean, this is Caribbean history from a Caribbean point of view has succeeded, perhaps too well. Writing Caribbean history as it's understood by Caribbean peoples has led to an essentially narrow and parochial view of history 
that views the rest of the world through a Caribbean filter. Right? So this is in the Journal of Record, right? the American Historical Review, suggesting that writing, wait for it, the history of Caribbean nationalism from the perspective of Caribbean people through a Caribbean filter was essentially parochial and narrow right? in 1978. This is an important reminder right, about the, the ground that Professor Knight had to trod right? um, and the ways in which, in the not too distant past, right, a review in the Journal of Record would suggest that studying Caribbean people's lives from their own perspective was somehow limited and flawed. It should be no surprise to us, however, that a strong rebuttal would come, right? <laughs> and it would come from historians based, again, it should be no surprise, in the Caribbean. No less than a figure of Bridget Brampton, who would not let that review stand. In the Journal of Caribbean History, and again, I just want to emphasize how important it is to have these venues, right? How important the Journal of Caribbean History is, right, as a space, right, to counter these narratives. In her own review, Bridget Branton, who is known to suffer no fools, right, um, writes her own review. Right? Um, she calls attention to right, uh, and illuminates the ways in which Professor Knight's pan-Caribbean approach is a welcome right, uh, response to often deeply insular narratives. And then in her paragraph, right, uh, she implicitly, and I imagine explicitly, takes on the review from the American Historical Review. She writes, and this is far from being a narrowly conceived regional history. Even if the perspective is from the inside, Knight frequently introduces comparisons with developments in other parts of the New World, especially Latin America, and shows himself to be constantly aware of the Caribbean's location within an Atlantic system and Atlantic world. This is an ambitious book, and there is nothing parochial about it. <laughs> I want to spend uh, the rest of my time uh, briefly taking up one aspect of uh, Professor Knight's argument about the interwar Caribbean that's been uh, deeply important to my own understanding of the period uh, and uh, the work that I'm uh, doing now. Uh, so the, the title of my talk uh, draws from one of the many really beautiful lines in Genesis. I, uh, where Professor, I, uh, Professor Knight, writing about uh, the labor rebellions that swept uh, the Caribbean in the 1930s, says, between 1935 and 1938, labor unrest raced through the Caribbean uh, like a cane peace fire on a windy day. Okay? That's such beautiful right, writing. Uh, for a long time, scholars of the British colonized Caribbean looked at the 1930s as a uh, period of tremendous shift, right? And looked at the labor rebellions as a kind of start of modern nationalism. Yet Professor Knight, uh, in addition to kind of uh, covering this ground, highlights the ways in which the interwar decades, right, uh, the 1910s and 20s and early 1930s, were also a foundational moment uh, for building uh, anti-colonial nationalist consciousness. Uh, in particular, I was delighted to see the ways in which uh, he uses uh, the experiences of West Indian soldiers who fought in World War I right, to bridge two eras that are often separated uh, in the historiography. In Genesis, he writes, outside of these organizational types, so he's mentioned things like uh, the UNIA, uh, members of trade unions, right? Uh, there were a number of individuals from all of the colonies who had served abroad in the First World War in the West India regiments. Some of these individuals, some of these individuals were of African birth, and after the war were given land and pensions in several of the territories, where they formed the nucleus of an early pan-Caribbean movement. The war experiences left them critical of the British government and of British society, and they joined the radical element of non-white, restless middle classes in agitating for political reforms to bring self-government to the Caribbean colonies. Uh, this was one of the earliest, this, uh, this kind of uh, recognition of the role of World War I veterans was really at the forefront right, of thinking about the ways in which veterans' politics also shaped the interwar Caribbean. 
a region where at least 65,000 men uh, served in World War I in ways that are often obscured, right? And this just tells you the largest number were from the French Caribbean because France conscripted across its empire, right? Uh, around 19,000 soldiers uh, were uh, from Puerto Rico, right? And then at least 16,000, but that's really an undercount because many West Indians uh, served in Canadian regiments or in other British regiments. So that number probably is closer to 20,000 at least. Okay. Uh, in his work in Genesis, Professor Knight uh, repeatedly thinks about the ways in which the World War I served as a radicalizing experiment. Right? Um, the ways in which uh, black soldiers encounters with empire during the war, including an infamous incident where West Indian troops are marching and singing Rule Britannia, and it is their white uh, British so-called comrades who scream, uh, you niggers have no right to sing that song. Right? Uh, the ways in which these experiences radicalize them, and not only uh, male veterans, but their uh, larger familial networks as well. As Professor Knight argues, right, uh, nationalism and class consciousness increased tremendously in the years between 1919 and 1939, the tantalizing interwar years. I'm going to start putting that like on my CV. I work on the tantalizing interwar years. Right? And then in what, I, so I, I mentioned this to one of the panelists, uh, Dr. Garcia, uh, but when I went back to revisit this work and I saw this next sentence, I literally stopped in my tracks, right? Like Bolivian Indians after the wars in the Grand Chaco, uh, the West Indians who returned to the Caribbean after service in Europe in the First World War were changed men. And what can only be described as a divine coincidence, uh, one of my closest collaborators in graduate school was a fellow student who was working on the experiences of Bolivian Indians in the Chaco Wars, and that we organized a conference together putting these two groups in conversation. We had no idea, right, uh, that basically 25 years before we were doing our groundbreaking conference, Franklin Knight had already put those two groups in conversation in a way in which only someone who's deeply trained in both Caribbean and Latin American history could do and know about, right? To put the experiences of indigenous Bolivian soldiers in dialogue with black West Indian troops to think about a more expansive politics of the interwar years. I want to conclude by also mentioning the ways in which Professor, Wright, Professor Knight's rather, work helps us to think about uh, the ways in which soldiers uh, helped to radicalize larger communities. It was not only West Indian veterans uh, who made claims on the state, uh, but other members of uh, the larger civilian society who also deployed arguments that uh, black military service should benefit them too. I'll conclude with the words of a uh, Afro-Cuban activist uh, and Garveyite uh, who was also a labor activist in Panama, a figure named Eduardo Morales. Right? Um, Frank Garitti has written um, about him in really compelling ways. Right? Uh, in an address to returning soldiers from the First World War in Panama, uh, and around 3,000 uh, soldiers were mobile, West Indian soldiers were mobilized from Panama. It was uh, one of the largest sites of mobilization, right? So when these soldiers are sent back to Panama, many of them had built the Panama Canal and then enlist uh, once the canal is finished, right? Uh, so they return to Panama, and Eduardo Morales welcomes them uh, with an editorial. And these editorials were published across the region, right? As soldiers returned, uh, black activists uh, in the Circum Caribbean took this as a moment to assess demands for the future. In my larger project, I argue for a kind of global history of the New Negro movement, right? And the ways in which black soldiers were really at the vanguard of articulating ideas, uh, both about racial democracy, um, and in this case, what they call a Negro democracy, right? Uh, and as well as uh, claims that the war uh, should benefit them as well. Morales, a civilian, right, writing to returning soldiers, said this, you left these shores to fight for the world's democracy. You left to make, quote, uh, the world a safe place to live in. But alas, you have only helped to establish a white democracy. You have only helped to make the world safe for white folks to live in. You have descended into hell in order to bury the old new people old Negro, right? So this is, again, coming from Panama in 1919. This isn't coming from Harlem, right, or London, right? This is coming from Panama in 1919. 
and you have returned to us a new Negro, holding high the standard of our racial purity in the face of the entire world, demanding equal rights for members of your race. We hope that you may lead us on the battlefield for the restoration of our fatherland, the establishing of, a raci of our racial integrity and an everlasting Negro democracy. Uh, toward the conclusion of uh, Genesis of a Fragmented Nationalism, uh, Professor Knight argues that, quote, to obtain political leverage, the working and employed classes only had two recourses, the general strike and the riot. Indeed, if we look at veterans' protests in the interwar period, we see just that. Right? Uh, returning veterans led a major insurrection uh, in Belize in uh, July of 1919, and smaller protests in Trinidad and Jamaica. Uh, returning veterans were also at the forefront of hunger marches in the 1920s and 30s. Right? Uh, and a smaller number uh, led uh, active political movements as well, kind of founding political parties and trade unions. Here we think of people like Uriah Butler, um, author Cipriani and others. Of course, Norman Manley is also right, uh, a veteran as well, though not of the British West Indies Regiment. Here, Professor Knight's uh, insistence that the general strike and the riot are political, right? that they are part of the politics of this moment, and not simply a kind of spontaneous response uh, to the economic collapse of the interwar years, uh, was crucial to help me to think about these in expansive ways, the ways in which veterans linked their ideological claims right, around discourses of race and democracy right, to material claims uh, for compensation, for land, and for economic mobility. Thank you. Um, so first, I want to join everybody in thanking Sasha Turner and Domingo Mangalani and the Center for Africana Studies for the invitation to be here today. It is an absolute honor to be in the company of friends and colleagues, and I'm thrilled. It's also been a lot of fun to have these conversations amongst ourselves. As Rena mentioned, um, we came to a lot of real realizations as we went back to revisit some of the earlier scholarship of Franklin Knight. And what I want to start by recalling an assertion made by Franklin Knight in another AHR piece, this time a forum, article entitled simply, The Haitian Revolution. In this piece, Knight noted, and I quote, that Haiti represented the most thorough case study of revolutionary change anywhere in the history of the modern world. He would go on to write that Haiti and the Haitian model of state formation was cause for xenophobic fear in hearts that stretched from Boston to Buenos Aires. Through that article and in that moment, like in much of his work, Knight painted for us a picture of a region, the Atlantic, constituted through the events and processes of the Caribbean as a place. Knight also wrote extensively about the sugar revolutions and systems of slavery that are central to understanding the societies that developed in the region. From Barbados across the Caribbean to Cuba in the 19th century, the development of sugar has become a defining historical characteristic. Collectively, these places not only engendered a place, but also, Knight Wright, fundamentally altered the landscapes of Western Europe and provided a foundation for the financial systems, and again, I reiterate what everybody has said already, of modern capitalism. Herein lies one of the continuing tropes of Knight's work and a radical intervention in the existing historiography of the time that has continued to shape scholarly debate into the present day. In his article on the Haitian Revolution, he makes clear that its genesis cannot be separated from the wider event of the 18th century Atlantic. And in this article, as in Knight's collective body of work, history through the vantage point of the Caribbean refracts an Atlantic threaded through the local and specific historical events that draw from the broader region on both sides of the Atlantic and always with global significances. And I start with this, with this example because this is when I met Franklin Knight as a student of Cuba. And I didn't understand then the radicalism in his work until I got to graduate school in history and started saying things like, well, Franklin Knight, right? And I, and I should note that um, my field as a grad student was Latin American history. From the vantage point of Cuban studies, Franklin Knight's work did more than shape a field. In revisiting slave, slave society in Cuba for this symposium, I, didn't, I went back to slave society in Cuba and I never left. 
I was struck by the fact that it reads like an exercise in Cuban historiography. The book, again published in 1970, contains many of the enduring questions that the field has concerned itself with, many of which have been, have been taken up by scholars in the field and some questions that I hope will be the subject of future scholarship. Writing again from the vantage point of the Caribbean, Knight explains that no other slave society was more attuned to industrial capitalism than Cuba after 1850. The importance of Cuba's late arrival to sugar, importantly through Knight's work, also lays the groundwork for contemporary histories of science and technology to discuss, for example, the impact that things like railroads and mechanization had on the island. This is a theme that people like uh, Jonathan, Machado has, Jonathan Curry Machado have since taken up in their own work. And it's also a theme that allows us to pay closer attention to the different forms of unfree slavery in Cuba from indigenous, from indigenous to Asian unfree labor. For studies of Cuba, the intensification of sugar agriculture traditionally follows 1763 in the historiography, which is the year that the British occupied Havana and the seminal day for charting Cuba's growth in sugar and slavery following an exponential increase in the number of enslaved people brought to the island by the British. Recently, scholars have moved to revise the numbers and to provoke conversa conversations around the numerical significances. Knight scholarship figures early in these deb debates. Knight noted that, and I'm quoting, the English did nothing that the Cubans were not already doing before they arrived on the scene. Again, the reminder here is not that sugar was an inevitability in Cuba and the Caribbean, but rather that sugar revolution was a theme across the region. These large macro level processes of agriculture and slavery are important for understanding the region, but I also locate the impact of Knight's work and his influence on my scholarship in particular and the local micro level transformations that his collective work on Cuba discusses, especially in relation to land. The sugar revolutions that I previously discussed entail the revolution in land holding that in Cuba was evident through the transformation of land use patterns and later in land ownership. This is a theme that scholars such as Sherry Johnson and others have visited to aid in our understanding of 18th century Cuba especially, but that also raised questions for scholars today about how land ownership functioned in Cuba after the Spanish crown in 1800 permitted the outright ownership of land that I think are current to this day. This is of particular importance to me because the sugar belt around towns and cities in Cu towns and cities around Cuba, as Knight illustrates, increasingly disappeared as the 19th century progressed. As owners were allowed to parcel, rent, and sell lands previously held in Yusufrak, we see the rapid development of land, land for sugar cultivation but we also see the environmental impact that sugar had on Cuba considered for the first time. Sugar cultivation was, was the main reason behind the de deforestation of the island and the destruction of Cuba's hardwood forest, a theme that Cuban scholars such as Reynaldo Funes Monsote has taken up in his work, and that environmental scholars of the Circum Caribbean from New Orleans to Havana are increasingly attuned to. Future work will continue, I hope, to take up these questions, as well as the ways in which science, environment, and disease are all histories embedded within the sugar cycles of the Caribbean. Already much has been written about Cuba and yellow fever, for example, and here I'm thinking of Mariola Espinosa's work on the transition to independence facilitated by disease. But at night also connects the rise of plantation slavery, not just to sugar and slavery, but to the ebb and flow of natural diseases, noting how in 1833 and 1834, Prime years in Cuba for sugar, cholera outbreaks devastated the island of many and engendered new cycles of illegal trade, including in enslaved people to satisfy the labor demands of the island. I wanted to diverge away from the plantation for a moment because while Knight notes the centrality of the space, he also provokes us to consider the role of the town. He notes that in, in accordance with the general pattern of Spanish colonialism, the town, like the Hacienda and the Vega, was a centrally important space with its own dynamics and internal logics. While the urban does not factor in, into this discussion, Knight's scholarship remains an early moment for the analysis, analyses of the specificities of urban slavery. For my own work on Havana, this has inspired me to think about the city as a radical first experiment in colonization, the importance of which played out across the Atlantic on the mainland of Latin America as in the Pacific. Cartagena to Spain and even Manila, the impact and centrality of the Caribbean remained to guide <coughs> urban planning measures across the region. 
And while in my own work I discuss the specificities of Spanish urban planning, there is, I think, a broader argument to be made about how the inextric inextricable connection between towns and cities of the region went on to shape an understanding of the urban than the one that we have that than the one we have come to know defined by Spanish or other colonialisms. There is a logic to the region, as Knight, Knight illustrates time and again, that is not defined by its linguistic, political, or administrative organization, however important these are. This, I think, is Knight's intellectual influence that extends far beyond the Caribbean and even the Atlantic. And before I continue, I, I want to add that in preparation for the symposium, I listed the topics of Cuban history that Knight has written about and back the impact across waves of Cuban scholarship, that the Cuban scholarship that subsequently took up the questions that Knight posed. I wish I would have saved that visual image, which looked like a tangled web of books and conversations with one another that every student of Cuban history should have read. And I stopped adding the books when I realized that one, this talk would be far longer than the minutes that we have allotted, but also when I realized that what I was really doing was creating a list of books to add to the books my graduate classes on colonial historiography <laughs> are already reading, and they're all tuning in. So, um, for scholars, um, excuse me, after the after that exercise and during this opportunity to reflect on my scholarship on Cuba. I want to pause for a second because I think to appreciate the full impact on Knight's work, it is sometimes helpful for me to see it through the eyes of a new generation of scholars who are themselves approaching the region without having internalized many of the, of the assumptions that moved the Caribbean so central to the politics of the region to the periphery of Western thought. And I'm currently teaching a class on colonial Latin American historiography, and two nights ago my students and I were discussing how to think of the Caribbean in relation to other fields of history and study, namely Latin American history and Atlantic studies. And they came to the conclusion that in fact, in order to understand the Atlantic beyond Brodel or Latin American empire, Latin America beyond empire, that it could only be accomplished by centering the Caribbean and thinking through, as one student so brilliantly put it, the waves of transformation that flowed outward from the region. This is an exercise that entails examining the fragments that provide the region form. And here I'm thinking about the um, example of the fragments or pieces of the base that come together. In writing about the Caribbean, one of my favorite quotes is Knight's description on working from within. And he writes that, and I quote, to look from, in, from the inside out is the only view. End quote. So while I have long understood the work of Franklin Knight in my role as, as a historian and the importance of a radical historiographic tradition, I also appreciate his methodological, and this is a poor term choice, but it's one that I've been thinking about and haven't been able to sort of um, come up with a better term, his, method, his methodological innovation. In another article, Crisis in the Contemporary Caribbean, Knight writes that it seems to him that when serious thinkers ponder the reality of Latin America and the Caribbean, sooner or later they turn to poets and writers. And he describes telling students to read the literary people of the region and the period. That was really striking to me because my own inroads into Latin America and the, and the Caribbean occurred through people like Nicolas Guillén, but also characters like Cecilia Valdez the main character of Cirilo, Cirilo Villaverde's 19th century short story on Havana that later became his famous, his famous novel written in exile about Cuba. Cecilia Valdez, I think, exemplifies one of the themes that Knight leaves us with in the introduction to that first edition of the Caribbean, the genesis of a fragmented nationalism. One, while noting the importance of linguistic, historic, and administrative differences within the region, Knight also notes that the separate or individual units of the region each pass through similar experiences, though they do so at different times. He urges us to think about comparisons with the region as cystadial rather than synchronic, and this was a word that I meditated on for days, and that frankly, I'm still meditating on for the effective impact that it has. Accounting for the very real local specificities, but also enveloping the Caribbean in its own time. And Cecilia Valdez was published throughout the 19th century, the first two times in Havana and the last from New York, and invokes, I think, 
a similar play on time and its ability to illustrate the evolution of a history engendered by the events of the region. I will end by recalling another of Knight's assertions, because I am in fact also a Cubanist. At various times and in various sources, he has noted that the twin revolutions of Haiti in the 18th century and in Cuba in 1959 were central to the evolutionary history of the Atlantic world after 1492. Knight's refusal to see the global importance of the Caribbean long after the end of her formal colonial rule has, I think, redefined the scope of his work, placing the Caribbean at the center, including of Latin American history as well as Atlantic studies and as well global history. And lastly, on a very personal note, I think I would be remiss if I didn't add that before completing my PhD in, in, at UNC in North Carolina, I came to the study of Cuba from Latin American studies on the West Coast. And as a young graduate student, what I knew of Cuba in the field of Latin American studies was that Franklin Knight was the president of LASA. So of course you could. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, this, is, no, this, this is great. Um, I'm tempted to just skip my paper and jump to the Q&A. Like, <laughs> but I, I think I do have something to say. So um, let me just thank Minka, Sasha, who I haven't met as yet. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Kenita for inviting me here because this has really been great fun and then to see people like Professor Meeks, and Nathan, friends and mentors. It's, it's really, really cool to be here. Um, let me also begin on a very personal note and gratitude to Professor Knight. Um, because unbeknownst to him, he's been like my intellectual guy as both a student and a teacher. So my first graduate course, NYU, my first you know, master's in Latin, Latin American and Caribbean studies, first book I was assigned <laughs> in history was this book. Um, as a novice teacher, early 21st century, the first book I assigned in my Caribbean course, <laughs> So, um, yeah, thank you so much for really being the person who has helped me find my way around the Caribbean history. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy for this opportunity to personally thank you. Um, I think it's also a wonderful opportunity. This is why I put on my glasses. I'm at this weird stage where I'm now doing readers, so I think I can <laughs> see without it, but then I figure I can't, so we do this. Um, Along with expressing gratitude, this is also a really welcome occasion to offer some preliminary reflections on the larger import of Professor Knight's scholarship, to ask some questions. Um, how might we begin to think about the significance of his dedication to crafting new worldly histories in an academic age effectively constrained or better contained by the Cold War geopolitical imagination? Um, what did Professor Knight achieve in books like Slave Society in Cuba during the 19th century? And he already mentioned Genesis. And in a more presentist vein, how do these interventions into the historiographies of slavery, colonialism, and racism appear from a more old vantage point, roughly half a century later? I won't be able to answer all of those questions, but um, I think we can do some preliminary thinking about some. So in this short a lot of time, I will highlight two elements in Professor Knight's work and suggest that taken together, they point to a compelling dynamic tension in his intellectual contribution. On one hand, I underline that Professor Knight intruded a dissenting Caribbeanist tradition of historical thinking into the Atlantic field instituted during the Cold War period. And I think many people have hinted at that so far. Um, extending and engaging the views of historians like C.L.R. James, Eric Williams, Elsa Papaya, and Walter Rodney, Knight subverted the liberal moralism and provincialism that dominated Atlantis' historiography in the quarter century after World War II. On the other hand, and this is where I'm really happy Professor Knight is here because it's more questions and we can answer them or challenge me and tell me that I'm crazy. But on the other hand, I want to speculate about how the Atlantic framework might have constrained the critical thrust of Knight's work. In particular, I focus on its categorical binary of settler colonies versus exploitation colonies. 
raising questions about its complicity with the moral assumptions that informed Cold War geopolitical imagination. Knight, it should be noted, was aware that his dualistic conceptualization of New World colonialism posed potential perils in our historical understanding of the Caribbean. And as a result, he wrestled with his own constructs. So I actually want to read some things where I think he's wrestling with this idea. The same cannot be said, sadly, for many historians today, as they complacently embrace settler colonialism with no concern for its disregard of the Caribbean as a region of historical failure. So as you can tell too, I'm using this opportunity to launch <laughs> a debate in the field about, about settler colonialism. And in, in some ways, I think Professor Knight's own contribution to that discourse has gone unrecognized and it might be worth a while returning to it. So this first section is called Demoralizing and Deprovincializing the North Atlantic. The work of Professor Knight can be read as part of a Caribbeanist tradition that subverted the Atlantic perspective then being established in the US. Two aspects of this subversive quality are worth stressing and appear from the onset of his scholarly publications. The first is Knight's reassertion of the materialist logic into an historiography and slavery and racism that increasingly prioritized moralism. The second is his reorientation of the Atlanticist area the Atlanticist area of concern toward the South. In combination, these two moves had the effect of undermining the historical image of the North Atlantic as the foundational site of civilizational progress, the exemplary area of ethical freedom. Knight's materialist challenge to a moralist interpretation of the rural slavery and racism appeared early in his career. The introductory pages of his first monograph, Slave Society in Cuba, included a discussion of the historiography that took aim fundamentally at the interpretation offered by Frank Tannenbaum and his followers. Right, I'm sure you already mentioned that. Tannenbaum, slave and citizen Knight reminded, pursued a comparative analysis that ultimately centered on the moral status of the slave and wider society. According to this long essay, first published in 1947, what distinguished the historical situation of blacks in the US from those in the rest of the Americas was the long-standing denial of their own good moral competence. Knight respectfully disagreed. Quote, Tannenbaum's valiant argument does not stand up to comparative inquiry, he wrote in the introduction of slave society. Instead, Knight turned to a Caribbeanist historian who had preceded Tannenbaum and whom Tannenbaum himself had rejected, Eric Williams. Mm -hmm. Having signaled a dissatisfaction with Tannenbaum's thesis, Knight's introduction acknowledged that in capitalism and slavery, William offered an alternative, an economic interpretation of the history of the Negro in the Americas. To be sure, Knight did not accept William's thesis in its entirety. Indeed, he felt that Williams had perhaps gone too far in the materialist direction. Still, in reading Slave Society in Cuba, it is doubtless that Knight was more concerned to modify Williams' materialist interpretation than to reject it. And by the end of the book, he was taking on Tannenbaum and his disciples in language that recalled Williams. <laughs> the economic basis of Negro slavery greatly modified cultural inheritances or the intervention of religious denomination. Explain that, let me read that again. The economic basis of Negro slavery greatly modified cultural inheritance or the intervention of religious denomination. Explain that, right here he's taking no time in moment. Likewise, he urged that historian should be, quote, less concerned with metropolitan institutional differences than with equivalent stages of social and economic growth, end quote. And again, this quote I really like. Slavery was a necessity because it was the only way to get and keep laborers. It was the practical response of sugar producer capitalists in a situation of open resources where accessibility of land far outstripped the availability of labor. Williams could not have said it better himself. <laughs> to appreciate the profound oppositional significance of Knight's materialist intervention, it is necessary to recall that Tannenbaum's moralistic vision lay at the heart of the dominant liberal nationalist imagination in the Cold War US. Tannenbaum, by his own admission, was deeply impressed by Gunnar Guido's American dilemma. Mm -hmm. 
And he, even more than the author of that epochal work, believed that the evil of racism had to be overcome by the moral conversion of white North Americans. Indeed, it should come as no surprise that Tannenbaum authored one of the earliest and most impassioned attacks on Williams for explicitly demoting moral concerns at the expense of moral interest in capitalism and slavery. In a revealing 1946 review titled A Note on the Economic Interpretation of History, Tannenbaum assailed Williams as a Negro nationalist and perhaps a communist who had produced not so much a piece of scholarship but a pamphlet. He literally said that. The communist part, I'm extemporizing a bit, but he has like classless society in quotes in the second paragraph, so it's a, it's a, it's a good hint. Thus began the effort to silence capitalism and slavery with the North Atlantic professional historiography. Over the next two decades, Williams's materialist interpretation either went ignored or misrepresented as the leading historians of slavery in the US insisted on centering morality. The outstanding example here is no doubt David Brian Davis, whose prize-winning book, The Problem of Slavery in Western Culture, effectively extended Tannenbaum's repudiation of capitalism and slavery. Thus, insofar as Knight recalled the validity of the economic approach identified with Williams, he was treading on subversive historiographical ground. Along with demoralizing Atlantic historiography, Knight scholarship also deprovincialized it. From the very beginning of its academic institution, Atlantis's history was intended to project North America and Northwest Europe as the capital site of progressive civilization, the ground on which universal freedom was founded. Carlton Hayes announced his goal in 1946 in the AHR, and Robert R. Palmer provided the historical narration in the following decade. Knight's work would challenge this geopolitics as he centered the Caribbean in the Atlantic continually pushing the third world into the first world conversation and using Caribbean history to interrogate North American historical self-representation. If the acclaimed Atlantic program here at Hopkins quote, always had a powerful tilt towards the South Atlantic, to use Jack Green's words, then Professor Knight was among those who leaned in hard to make that happen. And here too, I'm joining in, in Nathan's wonderful essay, which it could be included more here, but I, as I told Nathan, it was all in my head <laughs> so, as I wrote this piece, thinking about Atlantic here at Hopkins. Knight's writing on Haiti offers a wonderful example of how we kept tugging the center of gravity of the Atlantic toward the south. Whereas the pioneers of Cold War Atlantic history, thinking of people like Palmer, right, could find little space for Haiti, Knight consistently offered the field an inconvenient reminder of the momentous significance of Haiti in modern world history. The first few sentences of his classic, <laughs> as, as one would they just defined it, right? His classic 2000 AHR essay states it most clearly. And this essay, I, was, I use with my undergrad students all the time. Right? You can't assign them CLR James, they don't know, it's too much reading. You can't assign them <laughs> Boy, you can't. But you can assign them that AHR essay. It's like brilliant in its economy. So this is how it begins. The Haitian Revolution represents the most thorough case study of revolutionary change anywhere in the history of the modern world. In 10 years of sustained internal and international warfare, a colony populated predominantly by plantation slaves overthrew both its colonial status and its economic system and established a new political state of entirely free individuals, with some ex-slaves constituting the new political authority. As only the second state to declare its independence in the Americas, Haiti had no viable administrative models to follow. The British North Americans who declared their independence in 1776 left slavery intact, and theirs was more a political revolution than a social and economic one. So with this paragraph, it's like, what I want my students to get, it's got right? <laughs> While this idea might not seem like conventional wisdom, it was anything but taken for granted when Professor Knight first began promoting it in the 70s. In this regard, of course, Knight was again extending the Caribbeanist tradition that went back before the Cold War. Black Jacobins first appeared in 1938. And as with capitalism and slavery, James's book generated a lot of crickets within the North American <laughs> Crickets, James. <laughs> 
French Revolution in San Domingo, published in 1914 as the quote, best detailed account of that event. Yes, same author of Studden, in case you're wondering. And if you don't know, Google it. <laughs> but perhaps in the end, and I think this is part of the larger argument about the Cold War and its impact on the intellectual imagination, but perhaps in the end, we shouldn't blame Jordan too much. Or at least we should consider that his imagination might have been influenced by Cold War geopolitics. For after all, when Black Jacobins was republished in 1963, it was advertised as a, quote, history of the first revolution in the third world. Mm. Not a history of a revolution in the Atlantic world, mm -hmm. AKA the first world. And when James first published it, three worlds did not exist. Mm. So he didn't write a book for the third world, mm. right? So it's really important for us to think about this schema. And it was this Cold War schema that Knight's work consistently undermined. Okay, here's where the question comes up. But did Professor Knight ultimately escape the constraints of the Cold War Atlantic field? I'm prompted to ask this question because of Knight's own geopolitical approach to the history of New World colonialism. In particular, his consistent reliance on the categorical binary of settler colonies versus exploitation colonies. This dualistic framing first appeared, I think, and I can be corrected, <laughs> in his slender 1974 volume, The African Dimension in Latin American Societies. And it was then elaborated a few years later in his indispensable Genesis. I was calling it Caribbean here, but I'm going with Genesis. I like, I like that version. To appreciate my wonder about Knight's employment of the settler versus colonial binary, also, not to simplify Professor Nutt's really subtle thinking, it is best to quote directly from his third chapter, Patterns of Colonization in the New World. So I'm going to read some select passages to give a sense of what Professor Knight is doing here. So quote, view, and, and this is in the middle of, of, of a paragraph, but I think the meaning should become clear. Viewed from an internal Caribbean perspective, it is possible to place all the European colonies in the region on a spectrum bounded by two distinct and enduring types of communities in the region between 1492 and 1800. The communities or colonies of settlers and the communities or colonies of economic exploiters. Although these forms represented consciously or unconsciously the ideal goals of the would-be colonists, and hence would fall on the opposite ends of the spectrum, they could not be perfectly realized. They remain the unattainable ideals. The result, therefore, was a fluidity along the spectrum in which colonies move from one form to another, usually from colonies of settlement to colonies operating almost exclusively for the maximum production of profit for their politically dominant group. And another one. The distinction between settler colonies and exploitation colonies was not lost on contemporaries. It could be found in the observations probably best sketched by the joyless eye and poison pen of that ethnocentric Englishman, James Anthony Frew, mm -hmm. Regents Professor of Modern History at Oxford University. Writing in an entirely different context, Frew described two sets of colonies in the 19th century. One quote, as offering homes where English people can increase and multiply, English of the old type with simple habits who do not need imported luxuries, and the other set serving Europeans to go there and to make their fortunes which they can carry home with them. Despite Fu's unsophisticated economic view, his two categories roughly coincided with the basic goals of European colonization in the new world. One more. <laughs> 
Nevertheless, <laughs> and I'm reading a lot because I want to give a sense he's really wrestling, right? He establishes a construct, but then I think wrestling with the implications of it at some point, right? Nevertheless, it was precisely the distinct ethos of the exploitation society that made it somewhat anomalous in the 18th century world. At a time when more intellectuals were considering social structures as rationally integrated, the exploitation society appeared to lack a rational basis for its existence. Mm -hmm. okay, there's more. <laughs> okay, this one. <laughs> yeah, I was arguing with you on that, Professor Knight. Say no, say no. In the settler societies, the transfer of the conventional institutions of the metropolis provided a model for conformity and socialization. Newcomers could accept such norms and usually did. Dualities of status and power could exist, although not without some internal strains. The settlers formed an enclave that was determined to succeed and consciously set about discovering ways to facilitate their domination of nature. Settlers adapted freely and pragmatically, however much they deplored such actions. The very success in taming the wilderness lent zeal to what Francisco Lopez Camara described as la conciencia de sí, self-consciousness. A spirit gallantly portrayed by the character Hawkeye in James Fenimore's Cooper's novel, The Last of the Mohicans. By contrast, export, and I'm skipping a few lines, but it goes next paragraph. By contrast, exploitation societies lacked a common unifying institutional basis beyond the plantation and other economic enterprises. They were innovative only for self-preservation. Not only were such societies divided, they also tended to be divisive, with mutually reinforcing cleavages within the overlapping castes. The elites lack cohesion and self-confidence. And then the final quote, <laughs> And this is, this is the second to last paragraph in the chapter, right? Nevertheless, it's an important nevertheless, the wrestling is happening here. And, and here, this thing about hierarchy, I think Professor Knight spoke this morning about rejecting hierarchy and seeing difference as equal. I think this is what he's trying to do here now. Nevertheless, the cultural weaknesses and deficiencies of the plantation elite provided an almost unique opportunity for the coerced and subordinate African element to help fashion their society. Africans had more opportunities where they found the dominant sector in local communities, and so their overall impact varied across the region. I'll pause here, but I hope I've given a sense that settler colonies and exploitation colonies are contrasted in a way that, again, the US would be as we call it today a settler colony. There's something positive, progressive, <laughs> admirable about settler colonies versus artificial perhaps suggesting dysfunction with exploitation colonies. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to close. It is passages like these that prompted me to wonder if Professor Knight had not come perilously close in the end, and indeed wrestled with a Cold War geopolitics that cast North America as rational and hold, whole, and the Caribbean as irrational and broken. These moments in Knight's work also left me with questions about the sources of his use of the subtle exploitation binary. The dualism has origins in late 19th century European imperialist discourse, actually. It comes, I think, from a French thinker, Leroy Beaulieu. And by the Cold War period, settler colony served to signal the material fortune and moral virtues of former colonial formations like the US, Argentina, and Australia. Knight doesn't cite his own sources for this binary, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to ask him about it today. Moreover, the question has a broader significance now that the concept of settler colonialism has taken off in the North Atlantic. Unlike Knight, however, current users of the concept show little awareness of its problematic implications. Such complacency, I think, might have something to do with the fact that those who draw settler colonialism tend not to identify as natives of exploitation colonies. This observation leads me to conclude by returning to Professor Knight, or better, as Professor Meeks called him, the young Franklin. <laughs> if he wrestled with his own binary construct on what it said about the Caribbean, it was because I suspect he was a native of the Caribbean. A native in this sense is defined by Derek Walker, the lover of a place who keeps returning to it. 
might struggle against the implications of exploitation society because it cannot accept that Caribbean difference made the region dysfunctional or inferior to North America. If anything, he saw beauty in Caribbean brokenness. Indeed, read from this angle, we might conclude that Professor Knight, and obviously I wrote this during the break, <laughs> but it's really helpful to have this. Um, if anything, he saw beauty in Caribbean brokenness. Indeed, indeed Read from this angle, we might conclude that Professor Knight did realize, even if unwittingly, the, the Walcottian right to the ambitions of the young Franklin. After all, when the introduction to his 1978 book compared the Caribbean to the fragments of a broken vase, who could have known that Knight had aired the poetic imagery that Walcott would employ in accepting the Nobel Prize for Literature a decade later? Thank you. I must admit that I was profoundly impressed by these presentations because it reminds me very much of that Naipaul novel in which one of the characters is told that he shouldn't be ashamed of the way he speaks because he was speaking prose. So he went around to his friends and said after that, my God, I'm speaking prose. <laughs> yes. I think that if I had had these presenters as students of mine, I would have been a far better historian. Um, I think that there is a lot in what they say that is part of my methodology was not to look at a body of work all over the time. Each of these things, even though they seem to integrate uh, well, were actually separate uh, activities, you know, I, I, I had, the, the Caribbean book was an accidental book. Mm -hmm. It was just said, you should write a book on the Caribbean, largely on the basis of some reviews I had written, which showed that I had some competence. And I think in Sheldon Meyer's opinion, what attracted, people told him about me, I'm sure, but what attracted uh, my uh, doing it was he thought that I could manage other languages than English. Manage is the correct word, not speak. Um, but uh, it's also, I think, after I showed the presentation, that I was uh, grappling with the concept of how do you capture mobility, because changing times. Uh, they are very, very important to this. Um, when I sat down, I was in graduate school, was thinking about this, I don't remember which seminar paper we were writing, but Colin and I used to spend a lot of time together. We thought actually because Wisconsin was such a miserably cold place, that somebody would find us frozen to death in our heated apartments sometime. And I remember we made this pledge Whichever of us, if one of us survived, the other should come identify the body <laughs> and make sure they didn't just throw it out as garbage and say something nice about it. And the assumption was always that, given my lifestyle, Colin was definitely the one to do it. <laughs> but uh, one was, how do you take the, the concept which I developed long before I discovered that there was antecedents for this of settler and sojourner. And, uh, well, no, settler and exploitation. Actually, the original thing is settler and sojourner. And it dealt with studies of the Pacific at a much later period of time. But the book was published long before I realized that people had talked about this before. Uh, when the <laughs> cited American Historical Review came out of my book. I was annoyed. <laughs> so I looked up the author and found that he had not published either an article or a book at that time, and I dismissed it. I said, it's no use getting an intellectual conversation with somebody who doesn't have the credentials. And I'm a star, I'm an intellectual star. I mean, if you're not going to make an argument, why am I going to listen to you? Unless it's about something I don't know. I mean, if you come up, I don't know how many times I've engaged with people who tell me I don't know anything about wine or I don't know anything about rum. 
only to learn that I'd actually give them courses in these, <laughs> and so on. So uh, that, I think, is really good. Uh, in looking at settling exploitation, though, the key element which I omitted in the writing, and which is necessary, is a spectrum. I should have emphasized more the mobility of the spectrum, and therefore the importance of locating whether you're describing it as uh, settler exploitation in a moment in time. And I think that that really was uh, uh, essential to doing this. And I think in a lot of the insights that uh, Professor Neptune points out, I think they're right because I never considered anything I wrote or did as definitive. And sometimes I came back to it. And one of the things that was always difficult, and, and I heard Eric Williams as a student, I was really impressed by his work, but then my major advisor was Elsa Govaya, who didn't think that he was a historian at all. <laughs> so, you know, on the one hand, I like capitalism and slavery, and Govaya is saying, go do your own research, <laughs> get over that book. But the, the important point here was that uh, Williams, because he wrote in this sort of captivating manner, uh, tended to, I don't know, telescope his ideas. So in, if you really seriously read capitalism and slavery, they're not juxtaposed as binaries or polar opposites. Mm -hmm. There is, in fact, a whole lot of collateral things that he implies that what, uh, and, and I took that idea and ran with it when I looked at the, 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 the foundations of European capitalism as founded in uh, the Atlantic slave trade and the development of the sugar plantation society there. And what it did, what, what it seemed to me to do, was not, and you couldn't get this by looking at profit and loss or margin of profit. You had to look at the collateral industries that were actually stimulated by this trade. And what the key difference, you know, appreciating this was, was that only in the commodity, and African slaves were commodity, only in the commodity of people could you have capital, because they were exchangeable as currency, and a unit that created wealth and capital. So, no other form, not cows, not sugar, not coffee, nothing could be valuable and generate value. And what is amazing and uh, somewhat misunderstood and not entirely dealt with in the literature is the fact that most of these, until the 19th century, most of these successful economic enterprises were actually managed and operated by enslaved people. And you look at all of that. Uh, I mean, uh, currently they've been talking about Johns Hopkins and slavery and John McDonough and slavery. And one of the interesting things, if you look at McDonough's history, is that here is a guy who started out, and he comes from Baltimore with very little, he comes filthy rich. But every one of his enterprises, whether it was lumber or sugar or trading, every one of his enterprises was managed by a slave he owed. And he taught that slave as an apprentice. And several of his slaves went out and became very successful merchants. In fact, there was one that was richer than President Lincoln. He had more money than that. And Lincoln was not lacking because he had all sorts of, <laughs> what would we say, under the table expenses. <laughs> uh, but uh, all the problems we are doing are very complex. And, uh, we can look at them from an angle, but if you move, the angle changes the questions, and they're legitimate and genuine and serious questions, uh, take on a perspective that require a lot more research and thinking and scholarship than I could do, even in my long lifetime had I lived longer. But I had a lot of handicaps and weaknesses, you know, I was human. I had to find time for a family, and I had to find time for my liquids. <laughs> Speaking as the non-Caribbeanist who's trying to cross the ocean, <laughs>
I think what I'm seeing in, in Harvey's um, explanation, this whole idea of elite slavery that is not spoken about in, 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 Caribbean, in, in, in Atlantic studies. Whereas if you go to the Red Sea, Mediterranean, or Indian Ocean studies, you have this concept of military slaves who became elite commanders, and you have elite merchants. So you have this whole thing that uh, slavery was not just the plantation unit. You had them working in the date plantations and pearl plantations, which we had on that side. But there was this whole idea of those who were proximate to power and who were the elite. So they were a minority versus in the Atlantic, which you had was a large African minority, and especially in the Caribbean. So I, I found that I've always been fascinated by two things in Franklin's work. One is the cystedio and that chronic, which I'm actually using. It's, it's a difficult thing to grapple with, but once, once you look at something, it allows you, for example, to look at the conquistadores, as in your own work, Ben, and for me to look at what I would call the commanders from the Arabia, they went across to the Sahara and to Andalus. And so when you look at the same uh, phenomena at different times, it's a moving picture. So the act can be examined as an act, and the plays in plural then actually give you an opera. And I think by the time we get to the 21st century, you see, we do not, we, we can have all the different voices. But in terms of the settler colonies, one thing that I'm, I'm hoping will be taken up is the issue, the gendered issue. There can be no settlers without that creolization process that goes on and that creation of a new community. So I, I always find it fascinating that we allude to it, but it is hard to, to, to grapple with it in transatlantic studies because it is a Christian society. Whereas if you look at the Red Sea and Indian Ocean society, mostly were Islamic societies that allowed not only for four women, but recognized enslaved women and children. The outcome is the same. It's, it's enslavement, empowerment, etc. But it is the creation of new people. So I've always been fascinated by that settler exploitation things. And it's, it's, it's something that keeps on including us. So um, thank you. Yes, me. So I have a question for the panel. And, and frankly, you can say something on this as well if you like. Um, so I was curious about um, this idea of Franklin's work being a kind of political history, and to what degree there is in his efforts, as far as you can read, a genealogy of sorts for kind of explaining where black politics originate. So kind of juggling this question of nationalism and, and the, the complicated and varied nature of black nationalism in the 70s and in the 80s, do you feel as though in his historical work, part of what's there is an origin story about where black politics come from in terms of the night vision context. So even in your quoting of the Haiti essay, which again, I, I want to just coast that on as kind of a concise treatment of so that extraordinarily complicated history go, you're not going to find better than that. But your, your distinction between the US and the Haitian Revolution is actually about black folk building a political institution in the Caribbean, which was seen to be impossible in that context. And so is there a way of understanding Franklin's body of work is actually being something of its own origin story for how we're supposed to understand the formation of black politics in the Atlantic world and how those politics originate from be they economic, political, or labor struggles. I, I think that's an excellent question, and I haven't thought about it before. But it seemed to me, and again, I should have said this earlier in response to that Reddit panel, is that one dimension that's notably absent, but several things, notably absent in my work, but your question uh, stimulates this point, is critical mass. As we move about geographically, critical mass, that is, uh, for example, the fundamental difference between the construction of the Caribbean culture, wherever it is and however it is, and American culture, is that in most of the Caribbean, uh, people who had experienced slavery or people who knew about it intimately are the majority population. But also the managerial types 
especially the absentee managerial types, do not have the critical mass to have a coherent uh, leadership culture that the underlings can admire. Nowhere in the Caribbean do you hear, not in Cuba, not in, in Guyana, do people talk about this is white stuff or this is, uh, is, is non-white stuff. Because the white stuff doesn't really matter outside of the superstructure of politics and economics. If you look at all the cultural things, in fact, it goes back uh, Leibniz's 1654 observation of Barbados, where he's talking about how the uh, incipient slave society has become structured hierarchically with the whites on the tops, uh, free colors in the middle, and the Africanized uh, mass of slaves. He said that the whites are so bad, so, so, so as models of society that the independent, uh, intermediate class uh, do not even associate with them. Now, that was uh, an extreme statement. They did associate with them. But there's no doubt in my mind that if you read some of those, especially the merchant class, that they thought that these are hopeless whites, that you know, they are their uh, representatives. But in terms of the meaningful the structuring of that society and the operation of that society, they were not really useful. Uh, eventually, I would say that by the time you got to the 19th and early 20th century, at least in the British Caribbean, the British Antilles, what is most significant as an observation of the operation is how intellectually bankrupt uh, the administrators were from Britain. First, they thought that only sugar could save uh, a society, could be the economic basis for a society, sugarcane, sugar production, that is. When sugarcane, sugar production was fast losing out to beet sugar production. I mean, they didn't even know the reality of their day. After 1815, every single European continental country was self-sufficient in sugar from beet. So the re-export market, which before the early 19th century that the Dutch and the English used to create the wealth in Holland and England, was no longer available to these merchants in the 19th century. And uh, there are all sorts of other things which could stare them in the face. You know, the fact is that they preferred people to emigrate rather than pay wages. Even at the time when they were using taxes on wages to pay for the administration of the colonies. If that's not intellectual bankruptcy, I don't know what it is. And it continues today. Uh, I have gone a little more extreme and outrageous in saying that what do you expect from people who are breeding and misbehaving for centuries? But I withdraw that statement. Actually. It's, not supported. it's not supported by any evidence. At all. Yes, Herman. Sure. I, I, um, I sort of think about um, the res um, Frank's response to Nathan's question. And, is it, is it, and I would like to kind of pivot and ask, and back to Brian Meeks' comment as, as routing it through your panel. Because there's a way in which, I'm, I'm, I guess in some ways, what I wonder is, why is this not, like, in some ways, a history of the social sciences, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is a way in which this particular, the, the answer that was just given, the kind of work that you guys pointed to on the panel mm -hmm. of what you're doing, and then the ways in which um, Brian, Brian Meeks earlier was talking about, like, the zeitgeist of that moment, and you're thinking about, you know, Caribbean sociology, Caribbean social sciences of Norman Gervin, Lloyd Best, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, if we just sort of sat down and we understood, and if you could add Carl Stone and all the rest, you know, and the ways in which, um, and including um, Brathwaite, right, and, and Patterson, you begin to understand that part of that, that moment is, is, is not just sort of, not just try to offer an history, using history to think about the ways in which to think about the social sciences, like what were the nature of these societies, right? Back to Harvey's question about, you know, that moment of settler colonization and colonies and exploitation. I mean, these are questions that are fundamental to the social sciences, but what we have done, it, and I think Harvey's, Harvey's written about this, what we have done is we've made that into a European 
and for that matter, an American question, right? We can, you know, we can have the German social sciences, we can have the Americans, you know, Dorothy Ross, right, and so on. But, but this work, what, what, what you guys are pointing to and what Franklin's answer to Nathan is, and then the way that you, Brian, talked about it earlier, that actually is, in fact, what a social science is. Like, what is the nature of a society? How does it work? How does it hold together? How, does it, how is it fragmented? And what does that actually then mean in terms of the kind of the locus, the locus classicus of like, what is a society? What is the state? How does an economy work? And so on, right? So why, so what is it that, why is it we, it's not you guys, but why is it that we have lost track of this kind of global south, um, West Indian, Caribbean kind of formulation of, of the social sciences that is fundamental, that, that came out in that particular moment, that is fundamental to how most of us think. And we're just oftentimes just sort of saying, well, it's history, or maybe in the context of Latin America, it's a different way of thinking about the cultural question. <laughs> yeah. Maybe in some ways to connect these two things, right? Um, so there was a, a quotation from Genesis that I didn't um, put on the slide, so I just chose not to read it because it was a bit long. Um, but I actually think that it does show the ways in which, right, um, Professor Knight was thinking about what would, in other places, be some sociological explanations of change, right? right. But I'm not, I mean, this is just really off the top of my head, right? But I'm not quite sure of the ways in which the, the field of sociology in the US Academy is invested in the Caribbean mm -hmm. as a site of inquiry, right? Um, and so maybe that is in the, kind of why these questions have been taken up in history, right? Um, or perhaps at the intersection of history and historical sociology, right? But I wanted to read this. So Professor Knight explicitly uh, kind of tries to create um, a model for understanding uh, what he describes as the increasing social and political democratization of Caribbean societies. Everything I'm going to read now is a direct quotation. The roots of this process of social and political democracy derived from four sources. One, the economic diversification which opened up economic opportunities. Two, from the expanded educational system which produced a new professional class, three, from the dynamic expansion of organized religion, and four, from the rise of labor unions. While not of equal weight, they all collectively contributed to the formation of that strong tradition of democratic governance uh, that shaped the rise of nationalism in the British Caribbean in the 20th century. Right? That could certainly be in a work of sociology, right? Like that, that paragraph, right? Um, what I think is interesting there is the ways in which it kind of anticipates the intervention of folks like um, Tony Bowes, right? And thinking about black religious redemptive thought, right? Um, and we heard also from Professor Meeks, right, about okay, um, the ways in which folks like Claudius Henry, right, the kind of movements of the, the second half of the 20th century in Jamaica, right? So the fact that organized religion, right, um, in this case, black religious thought is included along with, right, thinking alongside things like labor unions, right, um, the kind of expansion of education, really for the, what I'm, now this is my analysis, for the kind of middling, middling class, right, urban middling class, right, and this kind of realignment economically, right. Um, you know, I think the, the question here is, right, always is a, this question about the weight that we give these things. Right? Um, and, and the relationship between these things in different spaces in the context of the 20th century, right? A place like Cuba, of course, after 1959, has a much more radical expansion of the you know, of economic opportunity, right? Um, and there's much more of a radical vision of the role of the state in the economy than a place like Jamaica after 1962, right? Certainly by Jamaica by the 1990s, right? Um, but I do think that Professor Knight is, is doing the really challenging work of trying to create these kind of topologies, right? To think about how large scale change happens um, at a moment in which I think, you know, this is again from uh, 19, the first edition, so from 1978, right? At a moment when also social history is becoming ascendant, right? And there, you know, there's a more of an effort to kind of think through individuals and how individuals are navigating these changes, right? 
Uh, so kind of thinking about a book like Genesis at the intersection of these changes, right? That there, there are, there's both the explicit call to think about the role of common people as the vanguard of social change, right? While also trying to create these larger topologies about Caribbean nationalism that attend to both local and regional specificities. I want to thank you for the question, because uh, it, Brian, when you were giving your paper, it made me, and this is kind of off the top of the head, but nowhere near as lucid as what Rena just <laughs> laid out. But um, I began to wonder when you were talking and then your question, um, and I guess this is also a question for you, Franklin, is when that group that began to coalesce after the failure of Federation, uh, I forget the, off the top of my head the name that, that preceded the New World Group. Um, Topia House? I, it, I, or, it was connected to that, but it had some kind of social science, a long social science name, and then it became New World um, But then at, around the same time, I think you had uh, maybe the group around uh, Braithwaite and Avang. And so you had these, um, you put that moment approaching the problems of the moment from different angles. And I think, you know, to what you're suggesting, Herman, maybe this gets back to uh, Nathan's question, is on the one hand, it is a, 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 a story there, a history there about the social sciences that are coming out of the Caribbean, or co not coming out of the, the global north or you know, the west as we, as we kind of normally think about it, um, but that it's in conversation with a range of other approaches that are appearing in the arts, appearing in cultural production, appearing in, in historic production. And I wonder if that isn't suggestive of an orientation in all of these things where the, the the story about the social sciences in the Caribbean and about the arts in the Caribbean, about the historical work coming out of the Caribbean, um, is going beyond the limits of any of those terrains. And so it suggests that everyone is kind of pushed to think a bit more capaciously than how in the US one was trained at that time to think about it. And so that's why you can get people um, maybe training sociology, but asking these much broader questions. And then that, that makes me wonder if the question around politics doesn't push us to, to Rena's point in, in thinking about Tony Bogues' work, if it doesn't push us to think about politics in a much different way, mm -hmm. so that we don't see culture as separate from mm -hmm. and only politics when we give it the qualifier of cultural politics, but that in a way it is an expression of politics. And so, um, and I don't know to what extent you were um, involved in any of those early iterations um, <coughs> or if it was in the background, but it just strikes me from all the conversation in, in your paper that this may be part of, part of the, the richness of this moment that your work, that you and your work comes out of. And, and maybe why I think most of us are historians here, but I think everyone here is also always thinking well beyond just the field of history. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think that you know, the, the question you really kind of gets at that in a, in a different way than the comments, what you were talking I know you're in charge, and we're actually over the time, but we, we've got now several questions. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if you would like, uh, I de defer to you on how you want to manage. We've got three questions. Do you want to answer? Yeah. <laughs> well, Thank you for, for <laughs> helping me to run our role. Uh, it, it may be better that we could have uh, some of this picked back up at dinner, because I don't want to push back the timeline um, for the keynote. But uh, I, I think you were going to just I say just, something. I just want to say very, very quickly that, um, this, first of all, Herman is an extraordinary, rich question. But it comes back to, to really the, the missing history epistemic history of the contemporary Caribbean. And you know, I think, I mean, that, that is yet to be written. But we have to include in that CAM in, in Britain, um, Caribbean Artists Movement. We have to, I, I think it's West Indies students, social, WIS or whatever the name was, the group that preceded yeah. New World. Yeah. Um, we need to think about New World itself. 
Um, and we need to think about, um, you know, individual um, people tilting at the windmills, like Franklin in, um, and, and Colin, who are up here, who are working through the same things, having come from a sort of Mona instance, but also trying to find and, and define an epicenter place. And frankly, um, you know, we can think about a series of, 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 of crises, if you wish, uh, one of which was Federation, which I pointed to, and the other which was, was frankly, um, the events surrounding uh, the, the late 70s and early 80s of, of Walter Rodney's death, of, mm -hmm. of the defeat of Michael Mann in the 1972 election, of the Grenada mm -hmm. crisis, the revolution first, but the crisis, and all these things sweeping um, the, the possibility, in, the intellectual possibility mm -hmm. of an alternative world and leading us into a, into a crisis, which, which then subsequently we see the gradual attempt to rebuild. Um, you know, and uh, you, know, you mentioned Bogues' work, you mentioned Patrick Henry's work, which, which are all post Grenada crisis attempts to rethink and rebuild an epistemic world, uh, an inclusive epistemic world centered on, on the Caribbean, looking out uh, in Franklin's excellent formulation, looking out. And I think we need to be very careful in looking at the rebuilding of that process um, to always have, and here I'm, I'm not historian, so therefore I'm speaking out of turn, but to always have that, that ability to remember the world we lived in when Franklin made his broad sweeping attempt to understand settlers versus colonists of exploitation. Uh, you know, it's like looking back on some of my work mm -hmm. from the early um, from the early part of this decade and you know f cringing at you know using Jamaican music and leaving female reggae artists out of it and only referring to Bob Marley. I think that really revolutionary is about Bob Marley. You know, but what about Rita Marley? What about um, Judy Moat? So in a sense cringing yes but also recognizing that who we are now is not who we were ten years ago or to, and we can't, we have to be careful about the time capsule attempt of dropping ourselves back in to realize all of the weaknesses of that moment. But at the same time, yeah, but on the broader question, we, we can't escape the, the socio political global crisis um, of which there are Caribbean manifestations. And of course, they're North American manifestations galore. You know, we can think about the drug crisis that led to the collapse of the, that helped let, lead to the collapse of the civil rights movement. Um, individual people who died and were swept out like Malcolm X, et cetera, and therefore change, helped to change the narrative. Um, um, but most critically, the global um, um, consolidation of a new world, um, the world of neoliberalism, which, which it, which eliminated the possibility of alternatives. There are no alternatives. There is no alternative. Uh, just a couple of comments. I have one question. Also, just before before we do that, I want to make sure that Franklin, if he did, you want to say anything in response <laughs> at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, make a quick one and then that's. Okay. I want to... Let me ask the question again. Like Brian, I, I'm not a historian. I'm actually political scientist and literature, and I'm way up in, in the territory of the Caribbean. But one thing I learned arguing with, with, with Franklin for over a decade and a half was that looking at the Caribbean as a region, just for example, the Mediterranean is never studied as a, as a region. So if you look at the Caribbean as a region, you not only have the Anglophone, the Spanish-speaking, the French-speaking, and the formerly Dutch areas. And when you look at it politically, um, definitely a vase of all kind of different mosaics. But what, I'm, what I would like to see in, uh, in my question to all of you is if you look at the Caribbean as a region, and can you compare it, for example? Are you open to some of these comparisons that, for example, I'm suggesting in terms of looking at settler and exploitation by going back in history to the 8th century, OK? Because this is a new world. But in the old world, we had our conquistadores coming all the way from Arabia to North Africa, creating white and black Africans, slavery, plantation dates, 
and to this day, a division between black and white and red. And so when I look at, at the Caribbean as, as, as a region, Franklin and I have argued so much about it that in the end, I actually was inspired by the Cisterio and, and uh, synchronic one. So uh, the conversation I'm hoping will emphasize not only Caribbean as a region, but as a, one that is comparative. So it's not a question, it's a comment. <laughs> Well, on that note, uh, let's congratulate you.